President Wyatt, members of the Board of Trustees, platform party, faculty, staff, alumni, friends, parents, families of our graduates, and to our graduates themselves, it's really an honor to be up here before you, and I have to confess, as the closer I got to the podium, I said, you dummy, what have you agreed to do? But I also know it's pretty special to be only one of about 110 people, living or dead, who've ever spoken at a Coker College commencement. So that's pretty, pretty special. So I realize the only thing between you uh, getting a diploma is me, so it's time to get started. It was Friday, May 16th, 2003, when my wife, Paula, my youngest daughter, Catherine, piled into our Mazda and made our way to the upstate of South Carolina for our oldest daughter, Rebecca's graduation from college. <clears throat> the weekend was filled with events, and as was the custom for this Methodist-affiliated institution, a baccalaureate service was held on Saturday evening with a commencement on Sunday morning. If you're not familiar with it, the baccalaureate service is a religious ceremony in honor of the graduates that's separate and distinct from the commencement exercise. On that Saturday evening, Reverend Dr. Talmadge Skinner, the college chaplain, spoke and addressed the graduates and their families. His remarks that night centered on the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8, <clears throat> telling those soon-to-be graduates, including my daughter, what was expected of them as alumni of that institution. And for the next few minutes, Dr. Skinner challenged those students that there was no higher calling than to seek justice, mercy, and humility in all they did. I tell this story because I've attended more than 50 graduation exercises, and I can count on one hand the number of people whose names I can remember who spoke, much less what they spoke about. But for whatever reason, 12 years later, I can both remember the message and the name of the speaker. Considering this, I said there must be something mystical and magical about this format, so today I'm going to give you my three expect expectations of what I think is required of you graduates by becoming an alumnus of this fine little gym in the PD of South Carolina. Now what I think you're going to find though is this is going to have a little different spin on it than Reverend Dr. Skinner. So here we go. Expectation number one, be nice to the pizza delivery dude. I agree with Sarah Adams, professor at Olympic College in Washington State, who said that she has one operating philosophy in life, that is be cool to the pizza delivery dude because it is a practice in humility and forgiveness. Let him cut you off in traffic. Let him pull out in front of you. Let him forget to use his blinker without extending any of your digits out the window. After all, the dude or dudette is delivering pizza to the young and old, single and married, families and singletons, gays and straights, blacks, white, browns, the rich, the poor, and those in between, and the vegetarians and meat lovers alike. And as the pizza dude cuts you off in traffic, give him safe passage, show restraint, show courtesy, and contain your anger. Being nice to the pizza dude or dudette is a practice in empathy. Let's face it, so many of us have taken jobs just to have a job because some money is better than no money. Professor Adams says in some of the jobs she's taken, she was grateful for the paycheck just so she didn't have to share her Cheerios with her cats. And never forget that the, in the big, fickle pizza wheel of life, sometimes we're the hot, bubbly cheese, and sometimes we're nothing but the burnt crust. <clears throat> Being nice to the pizza dude is a practice in equality. <clears throat> you and I are an equal in this world, not because of the car we drive, the size of our TV or house, how much we can bench press, the difficulty of the calculus problem we can solve, how fast we can run a 5K or the number of languages we can speak, or how many NCAA compliance rules you can recite. Our worth as human beings is related to the pride we take <coughs> excuse me, in performing our jobs and the respect with which we treat others. And guess what? It all starts with the pizza delivery dude. Soon to be graduates, tip the pizza dude well because that which you bestow freely and willingly will bring you good luck and a happy life. Expectation number two, never trust the fence. It was toward the end of World War II in France and three U.S. soldiers had formed a bond so close that they considered each other brothers. And while they came back from various backgrounds, they became family. After a night of heavy fighting outside a remote village, in a French village, two American GIs lost their best friend. The one that died had no family back home and uh, his friends wanted to honor him with a proper burial. So the two soldiers brought their friend and buddy into a small French village and found a Catholic church that had a beautiful cemetery. 
They went to the priest and said, Father, we know this is an unusual request, but is there any way you will allow our friend to be buried inside your cemetery? The priest knew the rules of the church that said basically you had to be French, Roman Catholic, and a member of the parish to be buried in the cemetery. The priest shook his head and gently but told them no. There were no other cemeteries around, and the two soldiers were terribly distraught, begged the priest, but he held firm to his commitment. As the two GIs were getting ready to leave with their fallen friend, the priest said, you know, there's really no reason why you couldn't find a spot beside the fence that lines the cemetery to bury your friend, and so they did. They had no grave marker, <coughs> marker so they planned to go back to their company, find something appropriate, and come back when they could. So three days later, the two friends brought a marker, approached the cemetery, and to their astonishment, they could not find the grave. They had just dug the grave three days earlier. How could it have disappeared? As they stood there in bewilderment, the priest saw the soldiers from the window of the church and came out to greet them. The, the soldier said, do you have any idea what happened? Where is the grave we dug? It was then that the priest said, yes, I know what happened. The priest explained, I was so troubled by what I told you. I could not sleep. All I did was spend the first day worrying about that and spent the second day moving the fence. You know, I like fence movers. Fence movers are kind of unsung heroes. We're all different, we have different talents, but being fence movers are indeed being difference makers. Moving fences is not dependent on occupation, ancestry, or social status. Each of us has a responsibility to move fences. There was a story about Harry Houdini, the great escape artist, who said he could unlock any jail cell in the country. Uh, he entered the cell, they slammed the heavy door shut, and he set to work on the lock. But this time, something seemed strangely different. 30 minutes passed, an hour, two hours. Houdini was exhausted and collapsed against the cell door, and guess what? It opened up. It had never been locked in the first place. Don't assume the gate to your fences are locked. It may open up, and if it doesn't, keep pushing over time. How many times are the challenges we face impossible or doors locked only because we think they are? It's not, so, not coincidental that when we put our minds and energy toward them, we often find impossible tasks have turned into achievements. Expectation number three, only three, when necessary, go cook supper. I love heroes. We need heroes. This story is about J. Wesley Perry and his family. J. Wesley was born about 1905 on a farm <coughs> near the Kentucky Indiana border. J. Wesley's father and his first wife had three children. Shortly after the third child was born, Mr. Perry's first wife died. And as was the custom in that time, the father took the deceased wife's sister as his new wife. The father and second wife had three children. Uh, including Jay Wesley and his sister who was born deaf. When Jay Wesley was only three, his mother died. So now the father with six kids decided to advertise for a mail order, mail order wife and ultimately found one in Oklahoma. On the day the train was to arrive, the father, six kids, got on a wagon, pulled by a mule, headed to the train station to pick up the new wife and mother to the six Perry children. As I heard the story, I thought, can you imagine what, how Jay Wesley and his brothers and sisters felt as they left the house. What emotions did they feel? I can only imagine what the poor light lady felt like as she was, was riding on the train. So indeed, the, the mail order bride got off the train, met the dad, six kids, loaded the wagon, and off they went to the church and the, from the train station and had a wedding. Then they went home and began to get to know each other and settle into a new life and live happily ever after. But you see, the story doesn't end there. Uh, not quite three months after picking up the Oklahoma lady at the train station, <coughs> Jay Wesley's father died. So now can you imagine what was going through the lady's mind? Following the funeral to bear the dad and husband, the new stepmother stood in the kitchen surrounded by other people's six kids. James, the oldest, was about 13 at the time and asked his stepmother, what are we going to do? The stepmother said, well, James, you're going to milk the cow and I'm going to cook supper. And so she continued to cook supper for the next 16 years. <clears throat> this saint of a woman stayed with the kids, managed the farm until all of them, including Jay Wesley and the deaf sister, had graduated from high school, turned the farm over to the kids, and moved back to Oklahoma to, to care for the nailing sister. <clears throat> you see, Jay Wesley wasn't my hero, but that Oklahoma bride certainly was. When I look at the lady, all I can see are traits that would, I would expect from a Coker grad. Dedication to a cause 
loyal, committed, positive attitude in the face of uncertainty, self-reliant, determined, action-oriented, having initiative, being resilient, doing what is right, helping others, and finishing the race you signed up for. Once when St. Francis of Assisi was hoeing his garden, he was asked, what would you do if you suddenly learned you were going to die at sunset today? He said, I would finish hoeing my garden. Clyde Edgerton, in his book, and when, said, in Where Trouble Sleeps, said, you know, whatever you leave behind is your history, and it better be good because your history a lot longer than your fact. And what a history this woman left for the Perry family. You know, strangely enough, I don't know her name, but I've guessed all along it had to be Angel. Soon to be graduates, there are my three expectations. <clears throat> One of my dear friends, mentors, and bosses, Jim Daniels, was the 14th president of Coker, and I heard him close so many of his marks with a little homily, as he called it. One of those he used was something like this. Life is like a sheet of paper white, whereupon which you may write a word or two, and then comes night. So I'm going to close with a little homily as well. Life is like a sheet of paper, paper, white, paper white, upon which you may write a few words, and then comes night. Soon to be Coker alumni, I hope the lines you write when you leave, <coughs> leave this place today will make a difference in this world, because as a Coker grad, you're always nice to the pizza delivery dude. You never trust offense and always cook supper. Go Cobras. Go Cobras.